Okay, um, hello from Oulu, from the Center for Philosophical Studies of History. Um, welcome everybody. This is our first uh, interview in the series of Scholars in Conversation. And today we have a guest from the Netherlands, from the University of Leiden, Professor Herman Paul, who is a professor of the history of humanities. And he has worked long in theory of history, philosophy of history, in historiography in general. And um, I'm going to pose a few questions to him and let him elaborate and tell about his views. Um, welcome, Herman. Thank you so much. Uh, I'd like to uh, start with the very basic question. So, You've done a lot in theory of history, in philosophy of history. So what was it that made you interested in theory of history, philosophy of history, and maybe in history more generally? Yeah, I think that I might trace those interests back to my teenage years. I grew up in a um, conservative Protestant um, milieu, went to church every Sunday, and I've been intrigued from a young age onward, I think, by the differences between that religious milieu on the one hand and the ordinary streets you would enter uh, as soon as you would leave the church uh, on the other hand. Uh, differences that have very much to do with the kind of self, the kind of person that you're taught to be. It makes quite a bit of a difference when you're here in church that yeah. The highest um, aim in life is to glorify God and right. to live in order to, um, to honor him. Or uh, the shopping street will tell you that your aim in life is to buy and to be a consumer and right. to create your identity through the stuff you buy and the clothes you wear and, and things like that. So my interest in um, issues of the self and uh, um, the vocabularies we use in talking about the self, virtues, vices, that sort of things, which have been quite important in my research. I think they can be traced back to that experience. Um, but there is another one, and that has to do with philosophy of history, the sort of uh, relations to the past. Um, when the pastor will tell you from the pulpit uh, about um, scripture, but also sites, John Calvin or Martin Luther as authoritative uh, sources. You sing ancient hymns and psalms. I mean, that's a quite different way of relating to the past than a society uh, that is um, constantly reinventing itself, um, instills in you. So that is another difference that has intrigued me from the very beginning. How, is it, how do people relate to their past? What sort of normativity or uh, authority do they ascribe to either the past in general, if that means something, or to specific uh, figures, texts from the past? And how is it that while we live in an age that Francois Artaud describes as totally presentist, uh, there are certain segments of society where um, texts and ideas from the past, practices from the past, have enormous standing and power. That has, um, I think, uh, triggered my interest in relations to the past, another theme on which I've been working. And well, when you're 18 years old and have to choose how to pursue this kind of interest, what study would um, fit it, uh, history is an obvious choice. For these questions, both about the self and about relations to the past, are not monodisciplinary questions. They can be studied from all sorts of perspectives, but history was an obvious one. But when I did my history uh, undergrad studies in Groningen, I had the good luck of uh, getting Frank Ankerschmidt uh, to meet him as the professor of um, philosophy of history. And I think his uh, lectures were just so inspiring by enormous erudition and wealth of learning that he displayed, um, but also by the sort of very creative and original questions that he raised about not only professional historiography, but more generally about trauma, nostalgia, and these sort of issues that touched very directly on my interest in what it means to live in relation to a past, in a tradition. Uh, so 
I think it was Frank Ackerschmidt's um, example that um, was mainly responsible for um, the choice of my uh, dissertation topic, Hayden White. Right. Uh, and um, my initial idea to specialize in the theory of history, right. combination of these personal interests and the very specific uh, influence of Frank Ankersmith. I think these are the two main parts. Yes, thank you. Um, sometimes uh, it has been thought that the past is far removed from us, so there's a distance between what we are at the present time and the past. But if, when I listen to you, I get the feeling that you think that actually we are closely connected to the I don't think we past. can answer that question in any meaningful sense without specifying about what people we are talking and what past actually right. we are uh, concerned for. Of course, um, if I may go, go back to the example I mentioned, uh, a church uh, on Sunday morning filled with people who feel very close to, for example, the uh, 18th century uh, hymns they are singing for they have sung them their whole lives, so they're very dear to them, even if there is a temporal distance of two and a half centuries. Yeah. But if you ask that same people about other 18th century phenomenon, uh, like enlightenment uh, culture in, in, in Paris, that yeah. would, they would be very uh, distant past to them. So um, it makes no sense to speak uh, about the past uh, mm. in general as a foreign country or not, mm. or about the present past uh, as something that envelops us constantly. Now we have to specify uh, what past we're talking about, to, w to which people at what moment in time. Mm. Should we no easy generalizations uh, as we, far as I'm concerned. Yes. Should we therefore talk about pasts in, pasts plural, in plural rather definitely. than the past? Yeah. 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 That would be more appropriate. Um, and I now wanted to ask. This is something that I preserved for later, but I want to get head on. When you describe the your childhood and maybe a tension between faith-based society, consumerist society or requirements for virtuous life yeah. and then another kind of life in the consumerist society. Um, it sounds as if there's a tension pulling to quite different directions. Sure. Um, did you want to somehow accommodate this tension or find some middle way or some virtuous way of life and this is my way to ask more generally, do you think theory of history can help to understand this kind of tensions and conflicts of, of our time? Yeah, these are, these are two related but distinct questions. Um, I think that you're absolutely right about the tension and, and the easiest thing to handle a tension is to resolve it in one direction or another which in the case of uh, a conflict between consumerist society and uh, church tradition takes the form of either delving into the consumerist identity and forgetting about the church or um, sort of immersing yourself as fully as possible in a, in a religious environment and trying to keep uh, away from all these bad influences as well as you can. That latter street strategy is not going to work, obviously. Mm. Um, although the former is uh, one pursued by many uh, people in my um, context as well. Um, I myself uh, don't think there will be an easy uh, solution to this uh, mm. tension, but I've been very much intrigued by that. So one reason that I've uh, a small one day a week job at the University of Groningen devoted to secularization studies. Yeah. Um, is precisely because I'm so interested in these kind of tensions. Is, does historical theory offer any tools for analyzing or handling them? Um, yes, but not exclusively. Uh, mm. That is to say, uh, when I study secularization, for example, secularization narratives, these are definitely stories through which people relate to their pasts, in which they situate themselves. Um, secularization either as a sort of, um, in a, triumphalist way, sort of emancipation from religious bondages, or in a more pessimistic way, a decline of the mm -hmm. church and the decline of church membership, uh, etc. Mm -hmm. uh, so yeah, that's what you can analyze mm -hmm. with help of Hayden White and uh, other narrativist uh, philosophers of history. Actually, when I did my inaugural address in Groningen in 2013, 
I added an appendix to my, the printed version of my inaugural address with a sort of methodological toolbox for how to study secularization narratives. Mm. And that was largely inspired by the work of Hayden White and other um, philosophers of history, even to such an extent that I sometimes half seriously present my chair in secularization studies as an exercise in applied philosophy of history. Mm. But this being said, um, historical theory or philosophy of history, terms that I tend to use interchangeably, um, are not the only resources that we need for studying either these specific religious uh, um, problems or more generally people's relations uh, with the past. I think um, to stick with the example of secularization, um, I've, I've learned so much from sociologists, anthropologists, even psychologists mm. with models of selfhood um, that help me understand how it is that people live in different worlds simultaneously or manage to, s to shift between different repertoires of behavior. So in a sense, um, I'm afraid that I've always been very uh, eclectically and, uh, interested in tools that help me understand these sort of specific problems, be it sociological tools or anthropological tools. Um, so if we're going to analyze people's relations um, to the past, um, it is not only historical theory that we need. I will give one further example. Uh, I did a project not too long ago um, with the Royal Netherlands Academy of Arts and Sciences on uh, post-concepts. Concepts like post-truth, mm. post-modernism, and we have a whole series of post-concepts uh, from the early 20th century until the present day, used not only by humanities scholars and so social scientists, but also in the, in the media, uh, even by presidents, uh, uh, large countries on Twitter. Mm. Um, the question is, what does this post prefix mean? Mm. It has an ambiguous uh, connotation of distancing on the one hand. You're beyond mm. modernism if you call yourself postmodern. Mm. But for many post concepts, um, there is also an element of continuing the legacy of. So, um, a post-industrial society is not a society that has completely abandoned industry, but has gone through s several stages and now transformed this latitude into something new. Mm. There is dependency and distancing. We had a wonderful conference in Amsterdam, in the Trippenhaus, uh, with mostly historians, but when it came to understanding these post-concepts, it turned out that post-colonial theory literary theory uh, were just as helpful in understanding the dynamics of distancing and um, uh, identifying as um, the sort of tools that I, as a philosopher of history, initially thought of. Yes, yes, thank you. Um, but you, you have also a, a more programmatic side of you. Uh, you have been advocating uh, HP8, so that stands for history and philosophy of history. Yes. And um, I wanted to pose a few questions on it. Very simply, what is it? Could you tell what it is and um, how you came up with this, this whole idea of yeah. HPH? Well, HPH, history and philosophy of history, is, let's say, the small, manageable, feasible form of the big things we were just talking about. Um, the big thing is interdisciplinary study of how people relate to the past. That's where I'm interested in, what fascinates me, and, um, except for the post-truth concepts, the, po the secularization you can think of. Uh, a recent study on history and financial times, which analyzes um, economic narratives, especially in relation to the 2008 um, financial crisis. Well, these are all wonderful examples of the big thing we're talking about a minute ago. But that's not something that can be easily institutionalized or um, even turned into a project or, or something. HPH is the more manageable form. Um, uh, history and philosophy of history intended as a sort of 
meeting space where historians and philosophers in Italy, although in principle others uh, can join as well, uh, where these figures would study history. In the first place, professional historiography. So there's sort of double reduction at work here. Uh, history is now reduced to professional historians. Uh, and the large interdisciplinary um, conversation is reduced to historians and philosophers. Why that twofold reduction? I think largely for um, strategic reasons. I'm a bit of concerned about the future of historical theory slash philosophy of history. Um, as you know as well as I do, um, people calling themselves philosophers of history or publishing in, let's say, the Journal of the Philosophy of History are a rather diverse uh, bunch of people, di very different disciplinary backgrounds, different interests. Um, some of them are appointed, um, for instance, in history departments for teaching uh, mm. philosophy of history. That seems to be the case, especially in Brazil and in yes. the Netherlands, two countries where you see this pattern uh, quite prominently, mm. but in other countries <coughs> too. Um, the worry I have is that um, philosophy of history easily loses contact with historians. It's, that risk has maybe existed always, since philosophy of history has a certain degree of abstraction and conceptual refinement mm -hmm. that's difficult to, to follow for um, some historians. But I think this risk is particularly uh, um, apparent in our time. On the one hand, because so many historians have become much more theoretically, uh, more, just more self-reflective than a generation ago, mm. um, which causes some of my colleagues to argue that there is no need anymore for specialized historical theorists. We have all become historical theorists, or so the argument goes, correctly or not. And secondly, because of all the budget cuts and things like that, uh, that go uh, on in many parts of the humanities, in many countries around the world. Well, then that sort of marginal figures like um, philosophers of history are, of course, the first victims. So um, if I think strategically about this strange field called historical theory, um, I think, well, if there is a future for this uh, field, it must connect itself closely to um, practicing historians in order to survive. Mm -hmm. In terms of teaching <coughs> positions especially, but maybe also in terms of research projects. We're increasingly living in a culture that, in which research means externally funded projects there is not much research going on anymore outside of these externally funded projects. And that has certain implications for the kind of research that we can do. Mm. Um, it always means, um, I think, um, sort of empirical research. Mm. A purely f philosophical study will uh, have big trouble getting um, external funding, as all my colleagues in philosophy tell me, because all um, funding agencies and university administrators these days expect philosophical analysis to be connected to empirical research. Mm. So, given these um, factors, given this context, I think HPH um, is an attempt to say, well, if historians and philosophers work together in understanding history, historical studies, mm. that is what philosophers of history have always done, but it's something that historians also need for uh, mm. and that's often very pragmatic reason. They want to become better historians by acquiring tools and modes of reflection that help them to uh, understand themselves and others. Philosophy of history is a bit of uh, ancilla historiae in that sense, a sort of um, service offered to historians to understand their practice as well as possible. In order to achieve that kind of understanding, um, we need empirical studies and we need conceptual reflection. We need them both. So HPH is a proposal to say, let us work together as historians and philosophers. That is to say, historians of historiography, please learn from philosophers. There are so many good theories, concepts that you can test in your own field which can help to refine your arguments, mm. 
And on the other hand, philosophers, please be attentive to empirical practice, especially if you make all sorts of generalizations about actual uh, scholarly practice. Listen to the practitioners, read historical studies in order to have sufficient empirical background. And a last comment, I'm giving long answers, I realize. Um, you asked where does the idea come from? Basically from my teaching practice. I've been teaching historical theory to history students ever since I was appointed at Leiden in uh, 2000, um, what was it, 2007? Um, and um, I've increasingly tried to structure, especially my research master seminars, as an exercise in mm. history and philosophy of science. So these mm. are historians. Mm. And I say, okay, the purpose of this course is not to transform you into philosophers. Mm. If we're going to read, uh, let's say, Carl Hempel's classic text on uh, explanations in history, um, I don't expect you to come up with clever philosophical uh, objections against these arguments. Mm. But what I would like to do is, is to, to familiarize yourself with this type of reasoning, and the best way to do that is to test it mm. in historical practice. So please write a paper in which you, for instance, um, try to find out whether in your field of study you come across the kind of um, um, explanatory models that Hempel recommends to historians, or whether you come across very different kinds of um, explanatory models. Uh, and if so, uh, do they conform to what some of Hempel's critics, William Dre and others, have suggested? Or how does this theoretical uh, debate about different modes of explanation relate to what's going on in your particular subfield, be it Russian history or uh, medieval history of Flanders, whatever? And that's a way of learning, mm. a very didactic exercise, if you want, that is very stimulating for it makes historians read philosophy of history and some other philosophy, philosophy texts. While on the other hand, it gives wonderful examples of um, philosophical theories that are sometimes sort of backed by empirical evidence and sometimes, well, they turn out to lack such an empirical basis. And I could think of many interesting articles that could emerge out of these, uh, these seminar papers. So it is this experience um, of doing history and philosophy of history in a classroom setting that triggered the idea and made me convinced that it actually works. Yes, thank you. Um, while, while listening to you, 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 you began with the thought that the field of philosophy of history is very diverse, very eclectic. Yeah. And then it occurred to me at that point that one possibility would be to create a paradigm, uh, make it more rigorous, have some more focus. Yeah. Um, and if we think of an example of, of philosophy of language, there's lots of different kinds of uses of language. It's, it's, it's very diverse too. But maybe there are some basic principles of behind the use of language. Yeah. So we could have a more rigorous yeah. Uh, field. So I think maybe something like this was Frank Ankersmith's idea of creating, I, turning I, philosophy of history into similar kind of analytic endeavor as philosophy of languages. The problem with philosophy of history is that all of us, including me, are constantly writing proposals on how such a paradigm might look like. Yeah. Both you and I have been writing programmatic articles, not once, but a couple of times. Um, so each of us has ideas about how the field could be stronger, more united, if just everybody followed the good ideas that we write down. It just doesn't work that way. Um, because we historical theorists come from, from so many different backgrounds, yeah. because we are intrigued by so many different questions, because we use so different conceptual repertoires or rely on such different authors, it's not possible to impose a single paradigm on this heterogeneous crowd. In fact, what holds the thing together is, I think, partly journals, history and theory, 
Journal of Philosophy of History, Rethinking History. These are three journals that serve as a sort of infrastructure for, if not always meaningful conversation, then at least some kind of exchange between these different things. And secondly, um, some authors like Hayden Watt, yeah. who I think was someone who almost all of us could relate to in one way or another, positively or negatively, either by identifying with aspects of his works or dissociating ourselves from, uh, from other elements. It also was, this, in a sense, a sort of connecting figure for many of us. Yes. Um, so it's a matter of speculation whether his recent death means a further fragmentation of the field. It's too early to tell. Yeah. But that's my impression. So that's a call for a paradigm. Well, I'm not so convinced that um, colleagues will be uh, listening obediently to the instructions they receive from either uh, Finland or the Netherlands about how such a paradigm might look like. <laughs> yes, I agree. Um, so you call for uh, more cooperation, in other words. Um, so HBH is clearly modeled after HBS, History and Philosophy of Science. And now the, the question comes, this is a rocky road behind between history of science and philosophy yeah. of science. Yeah. Sometimes the relation has been described as marriage, but as a failed marriage. Yeah. And the obvious question is, are, are you not scared of the history of HBS yeah. and of the difficulties they have been yeah. faced with? Um, first thing to say is HPH is, is not a paradigm. It's not something I want to impose on, on the field. It's rather a sort of, I call it a hermeneutic space, a meeting space in which different disciplinary perspectives can meet, can learn from each other in sometimes unpredictable ways. Um, I've called it indeed deliberately after the HPS example, History and Philosophy of Science, in order to suggest this is not something new, something we have to start from scratch, but this is something that has been done in the history and philosophy of science and even among historical theories. I can give some examples of that later on. Um, but um, as you rightly point out, the danger of invoking HPS is that you invoke also the wrong kind of connotations. And I think it's been a huge mistake um, to call HPS a marriage, failed or otherwise. Especially if we take marriage then in the sort of modern romantic sense of the word, where the two partners uh, so much resemble each other that they can sort of fuse into that single happy couple. That's, I know that um, philosophers of science have been debating their relation to historians of science since the 1970s in precisely these terms. But it has been such an unfortunate choice of terms. Mm -hmm. um, for what matters is a learning environment where people from different backgrounds come together to enrich each other. Doesn't mean that they have to stay together for the rest of their lives or that they have to resemble each other or that they have to find sh common ground before they can start a meaningful conversation. All these sort of things that philosophers of science have pointed out as lacking in HPS. No, that's not how learning works. Mm -hmm. We can learn a lot of things from people who are very different from us and we, which we we'll, we'll prefer not to marry, but at least can chat mm -hmm. over a coffee and inquire about a recent book or whatever. And we can take away lots of inspirations from interdisciplinary conversations. But we don't have to assume that um, historians and philosophers would walk together for the rest of their lives. Also, uh, I think HBS um, has been institutionalized to a much further degree than is feasible for HPH. It probably won't be institutionalized beyond the research seminar I'm offering at Leiden. Um, and that has once again been both an advantage and disadvantage of HPS. The advantage is that it could uh, grow strongly and it has all sorts of um, uh, graduate programs, uh, journals, conferences, book series, um, which gave an enormous boost to uh, history and philosophy of science. Um, 
the disadvantage is that once you're institutionalized in the same program, in the same building, in the same book series, uh, yeah, just you're forced to um, to negotiate some of these uh, ongoing uh, differences in a much more detailed way than I would imagine happens in HPH. I think of people borrowing from each other, testing each other's theories, but without calling into question disciplinary identities. Mm -hmm. Historians can remain historians, the philosophers can remain philosophers. Mm -hmm. But their work becomes better if they learn from each other. Mm -hmm. So in a sense, it is a very modest, a very pragmatic mm -hmm. proposal. And it's not an attempt to um, just create just another version of HPS as ambitious as HPS was. Yeah. So, um, to continue a little bit on this line of reasoning and ask a, a couple of more detailed questions, yeah. uh, it seems to me that one of the guiding principles, the driving forces behind HPH is to naturalize the study of history, naturalize philosophy of history, naturalize theory of history. Yeah. That is to say, the, firstly, we should study empirically rather than conceptually. And um, I, I think you wrote in a recent or forthcoming paper, and this is a quote, um, it should be studied with an eye to uncovering what kinds of interpretations, explanations, inferences and narratives historians actually produce or consume. So now, in, in relation to this, I just wanted to ask you whether HPH is actually, is it fair to portrayed as a historian's call for, for philosophers to be more empirically accountable. And another way to see it, that actually you would be advocating naturalism as the sort of correct philosophy yeah. of history, philosophy of Yeah, science. there are a couple of things here. Um, I try to emphasize that HPS is not so much a philosophical project, let alone a philosophical position but rather a strategic way of uh, organizing some sort of cooperation that fits both educational needs and uh, the, the, the research infrastructure in which we currently find ourselves. Uh, it's true that my own affinities probably uh, um, go quite some direction uh, into the direction of uh, philosophical naturalism, at least a project of naturalizing uh, uh, philosophy of um, history, philosophy of science, that's something uh, which I feel sympathetic, but don't want to um, advocate as a, as a, as a program. Um, and what I especially would like to avoid is um, the idea that the only type of philosophizing that I would um, be happy to admit in such a learning environment would be a kind of philosophizing that starts from empirical studies while ignoring conceptual ones. That's, that's, not, that's going much too far. I think we need, that's the whole idea, we need both empirical and conceptual reflection. However, in order for philosophers to be um, not only understandable but also um, meaningful conversation partners to historians, it would help if they would not constantly rely on the same stock examples, which mm. are reproduced again and again, uh, and which often have very little relation to what historians actually do. We get on Burkhardt and the Renaissance as a, an example of a collegatory um, uh, concept and things like that. Well, that's one and a half century ago. Um, are we still using similar forms of colligation as Burkhardt did? And only in these high profile concepts like Renaissance, or also in talks we're having now, probably so, but we need to find out. It would be helpful if instead of reproducing and reanalyzing the same set of stock examples, philosophers of history would take the trouble to read some historiographical studies which actually give concrete, detailed, up-to-date examples of what historians do these days. And I say that for strategic reasons in terms of how to reach an audience, how to make historians interested in this philosophical work. Mm. Try to do something that's close to the world they're living in, mm. something that's easily recognizable as this is indeed what historians do. And now what has the philosopher to say about that? Mm. What does he or she 
distinguish in terms of epistemic practices or ontological mm. commitments in the sort of things that we as historians do. Mm. So um, both um, advocates and critics of naturalizing programs would be welcome at the table, the table called HPH. <laughs> um, I think we need, uh, we can be very ecumenical in this respect. But I do think that the conversation benefits quite a bit from historians being not too fearful of difficult concepts, higher levels of generalization and abstraction. They could learn a lot from historians of science, who I think show uh, how historical work can be enriched by philosophical uh, work. Think of Lauren Dostan and her colleagues in Berlin. While on the other hand, um, philosophers would find easier to reach out to historians once they take their work a little more serious mm. than they sometimes tend to do. Mm. This um, brings to my mind a specific challenge, a, a potential challenge to the to HPH or to, the, to an approach that emphasizes empirical side. Yeah. And that's that, supposing we want to have a theory of history or theories of history, yeah. we would like to say something general about what history, history writing, history researching is. And now if we begin from an empirical side, aren't we always challenged with the problem of inductivism? So we can go and identify certain practices in this locality or in that locality or in that community and in that community. Yeah. Uh, and we have only finished time. So are we ever able to come to any sort of generalization on that basis? Or are we in the end have just an array of localized descriptions of this and that practices? So do we, give, so do we, so do we give up on theory of history in that sense? No, no. I think the problem you sketch is a real one, but it's one that all of us all academics are familiar with. Yeah. If you are a sociologist, an anthropologist, or a historian, we encounter this problem on a daily basis. So, um, every historian who studies, let's say, emotions in history, emotions in historical studies, based on a single Finnish example, mm. will generalize from this specific Finnish example to emotions among historians. Yes, that's what we'll do all the time. And, but we wait uh, until some other colleagues will do similar research with other colleagues, uh, with other case studies, so as to adjust the inferences made from this single case and say, well, if you're going to compare some more case studies, we will nuance uh, our um, inferences so as to make them cover these empirical mm. case studies as well as they can. That's what our scholarly debate is all about. So this is not a problem specific to HPS or to the sort of empirical study of history that I'm advocating. It's a problem that all of us deal with on a daily basis and are fairly successful in doing so, I think. Would you say differently? Um, yes, it's, 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 it's probably a constant process of adjusting our views. That's, that's what I agree with. But I might not be entirely in agreement regarding the priority question of empirical and conceptual. And maybe I try from another perspective to pose yeah. you a question. Um, when and if we want to identify interesting practices, inferences or narratives or something that yeah. are relevant regarding justification or where to show vices, so those are conceptual issues. So we, um, that's my question, don't we actually begin with concepts? And concepts are like spotlights yeah. and they identify us to pick up, okay, this fills the criteria, so this is a virtue, this is a vice. So we actually work from conceptions or concepts to empirical or... That's, I, I think you're entirely right about that. That's how research usually starts. And, but there is a feedback loop that yeah. we adjust our theories in the light of what we find. 
And the reason that I'm constantly using uh, hermeneutics, hermeneutic space and similar um, uh, phrases, um, wants to draw attention precisely to these hermeneutic circles between the empirical and the conceptual. We has, have to um, enrich each other. And you may be right that maybe we start with um, the conceptual, although uh, maybe not always uh, the case. If I um, think of um, my own research uh, in recent years, um, it's clear that uh, you can start with the notion of objectivity to um, find out how scholars around 1900 thought about objectivity and whether there's any relation to what contemporary epistemologists would understand uh, objectivity to be. But then um, there is a feedback loop. Uh, once you study those scholars around 1900, it turns out that they understand objectivity is as one intellectual virtue among others. And it turns out that in their source material, uh, language of virtue is permeating every genre which they're writing. Which makes me wonder how to, what name could I give to this? And that's made me, that triggered my interest in virtue epistemology. For example, well, these are epistemic virtues. Mm. And I've read quite a bit of virtue epistemology because I encountered so much language of virtue in my 19th century sources. Mm. And I think all I want to say is how wonderful would it be to keep this interaction going mm. instead of um, drawing disciplinary um, boundaries between people that specialize in either the conceptual or the empirical. Yes, yes, that's very, very reasonable indeed to my mind. I uh, would like to ask about the hermeneutic space, um, well, you've talked about it already, but just a, maybe a clarifying question. Yeah. Um, what exactly is it? In what form it exists? Or, you know, what kind of practice does it involve? Is it, is it, is it, is it actually physical in the rooms or is it, is it a virtual, uh, something conversation on the, the pages of journals? And maybe I, I add this to who exactly is invited to this hermeneutic space. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, as I said, everybody is welcome, but for practical reasons, it makes yeah. sense to, uh, to start with uh, only a couple of people, as in real life. Um, no, um, as, as this is clearly modeled after my own teaching experiences, um, I think sitting together around texts, be it primary source material or philosophical texts, that's a very productive way of learning. Uh, it's always how I try to organize workshop. If possible, I try to uh, convince people to submit their material in advance so as to discuss pre-circulated papers. The learning outcomes are usually much higher than if you just uh, listen to uh, people or uh, browse through uh, articles, which usually means we only read uh, the abstract and the first and last lines. Of course, I cannot um, predict in advance what will happen in a learning environment. Mm -hmm. It's in the nature of learning that is, it's, it cannot be, um, it cannot be predicted in advance what people will learn or what sort of creative associations a conversation will trigger. So, um, using language of hermeneutics is on the one hand to suggest that this is not a research protocol that we can follow with some guaranteed outcomes or so. No, our conversations may get stuck and we may misunderstand each other and get frustrated with each other. That's well possible. This is real life after all. Um, but on the other hand, hermeneutics, um, because experience teaches that creativity, intellectual renewal, so often comes from borrowing from other disciplines, listening to other voices than those of your colleagues uh, in your own department. I think that's, be prepared to defend it as an empirical claim that so many innovation in historical studies mm. comes from borrowing from uh, neighboring disciplines. So that gives me some confidence to say, if historians and philosophers would spend time together, mm. preferably physically, although you can think of other formats. Um, I have the reasonable hope 
that they will learn from each other and that historians will have a larger, um, not only conceptual toolbox, but also some, some sort of sense for philosophical issues that um, an ordinary history um, program will not teach them and that vice versa, philosophers will get interested mm. in the sort of things that historians actually do. Mm. And if I may add one thing to that, what, what I would hope uh, is that um, philosophers would notice some of the interesting things going on, for example, in the history of science and the history of the humanities, um, the history of historiography, for example, has long been focused on problems of methods, problems of approaches. But these days, we find ourselves talking not only about virtues and vices, my favorite uh, topic, but also about the emotions I already mentioned, about uh, how um, certain pedagogical regimes, uh, social conditions or experiences um, translate into historical studies. Um, the, the palette of, of topics, mm -hmm. of approaches has become so much richer mm -hmm. as in the history of science. I don't see that happening to the same degree in philosophy of science, perhaps with the exception of feminist uh, philosophy of science. Despite all practice-based approaches that have become very popular in recent years, um, I have come across very few philosophical reflections on the relation between cognition and emotion. Mm. Or uh, in uh, the Journal of the Philosophy of History, which mm. we're cooperating as editors, mm. um, we haven't had many uh, recent submissions trying to make sense of a historians' emotional involvement uh, mm. in their work, uh, for example. Well, that's a topic that is richly debated among historians mm. of historiography. Mm. So, hopefully the good table conversations mm. that I envision under the heading of HPH mm. would inspire philosophers to explore some mm. of these new themes mm. with equal conceptual rigor as they um, think about justification, truth, objectivity, and other classic themes. Mm. Yes, I, I think, I think you're, you're right about that. And just uh, it makes me to make a few observations when you think about the role of emotions, for example, in, yeah. in, in, in history, history of science. It sounds as if it's a, in HPS side, it would be a social history of science. And you're probably right that philosophers have not done a lot of work on that. There might be some, there be something. some something on the yeah. where the emotional response could be a cognitive response as well. Yeah. But you're probably right. Some philosophers have reacted to in the way that they have founded a different society, philosophy of science in practice. Yeah. Still, yeah. I'm not sure if they reflect so much on the social yeah. history either, but practices in the sciences at least. I remember that we were um, discussing by email how to uh, advertise the Journal of the Philosophy of History on the website of the publisher and we were explicitly inviting submissions on let's say the philosophy of nostalgia. Mm. Nostalgia being a way of dealing with the past right. and yeah. we said well, we would be very interested if we would have philosophers analyzing that type of relations to the past. Yes. We don't get any submission that vaguely resembles this. So, so far, not so, yet, but maybe <laughs> they will follow. Readers of this interview, of, uh, watching this interview, will be <laughs> welcome to submit that piece. Yeah. yeah. So I, I would like to talk a little bit uh, still about the sort of, if I can call the Dutch experience yes. regarding theory and philosophy of history. It seems to be that the Netherlands is uh, somehow a special place for theory and philosophy of history. Yeah. It has relatively long tradition in modern sense, at least. It has been institutionalized in several universities, Leiden, Amsterdam, Groningen, Utrecht. Amsterdam, yeah. So several places which is not really found, I don't know, if, if anywhere. And um, I recently read this Jack Boss's paper about the theory of history, role of theory of history in the Netherlands history department and more widely. And it was a kind of an eye opener yeah. uh, that there's a different, um, let's say, route to legitimize and practice theory of history. 
which doesn't, by the way, fit with the usual narrative of uh, speculative philosophy of history, critical philosophy of history, and, very bad and the narrative. Yeah. Um, so, simply the question: So, what is it about the Netherlands? Why, why, yeah. is, it, why is it a special aptitude or yeah. sensitivity? To yeah, it? yeah. It's it's nice to talk that um, together with Jacques Bosman you mentioned and uh, Krein Thijs. Um, we did um, a special issue of a Dutch history journal uh, on the occasion of Chris Lawrence's uh, retirement a couple of years ago on precisely this question. Why is the Netherlands um, a country with more subscribers to history and theory than, every, than any other journal, as uh, Richard Van already observed uh, long ago? And I think there are basically two answers you can give. A short-term answer and a more longer-term answer. The short-term answer is that um, um, the subject, that is, historical theory or philosophy of history or methodology of history or history of historiography, was uh, made a compulsory um, subject for history students in the early 1980s. And it has been that ever since. That means that every single history program has to offer a couple of courses in uh, this broad area. It so happened that at the time, quite a few talented people were available. Uh, so, Chris Lorenz, Frank Ankersmit um, are just two examples um, of people appointed around 1980 uh, and who have really given some profile to um, Dutch philosophy of history. Interestingly, um, this requirement was the um, a result of a successful student lobby in the 1970s. Um, so many students felt that their history programs were much too traditional, much too focused on political history, very source oriented. They wanted to change that and mm. they believed, correctly or not, that philosophical reflection would be a means for realizing that. I think in the 1970s it concretely meant let's look at French annals historiography, let's look at uh, social science history as advocated by uh, our German uh, neighbors in order to, um, re to renew um, Dutch history. So it was a bit of ironic that uh, people like Frank Ankersmit uh, got appointed who were not exactly great friends of that agenda. Mm. Um, so that's the short-term answer. Um, demand for institutionalization of um, historical theory, which has been a feature of Dutch history programs ever since. But the longer term um, should not be ignored, uh, for it always strikes me uh, that already in the late 19th, early 20th, mid 20th century, there was a vibrant culture of debate around um, things we would now classify as philosophy of history. And at that time, mm. usually were classified as theoretical history or philosophy of history. Um, philosophy of history, not in the sort of critical philosophy of history sense as we would recognize it these days, but rather as a realm of reflection around the potentially worrisome implications that historical methods or historicism might have on uh, such normative um, discourses uh, as we find in theology, ethics, philosophy, uh, political theory, and on a more existential level, uh, how do you deal with the existential insecurity that comes when you discover in the course of your studies that everything is floating, that mm. every generation has had its own philosophical system, its own ethical uh, beliefs, etc. That's are the kind of questions that we uh, routinely associate with the crisis of historicism in the mm. 1920s and 30s. And indeed, if I look at the Netherlands and the Dutch universities, my own university in Leiden, I noticed that in the 1920s, it was Johan Huizinga in the history department who was offering philosophy of history courses, responding directly to Ernst Trulsch's and the problem of historicism. This was not about epistemological questions, but about ethical questions. And Karl Rusing in the theology uh, departments, also offering courses in philosophy of history, because he felt that theological reflection um, had to 
come to terms with this historicist challenge. Mm. Same is true for the 1950s. If I look at courses in philosophy of history offered there, it's an eclectic combination of some epistemological questions, some methodological questions, but inevitably also questions about mm. meaning. Is there any meaning in history? How can you be a historian and a believer simultaneously? Uh, these are questions that were course, coursework in the 1950s. Mm. Um, and I think precisely because the Netherlands, at least until the 1950s, 1960s, were a very um, religious country, enormous high rates of church-going people, um, which means a lot of historians also we were um, very active in churches and in uh, religious organizations, that it's only natural that there is a lot of mm. reflection on these issues. So there is a longer tradition, mm. which I think should not be ignored mm. in uh, explaining the so-called success of um, Dutch mm. philosophy of history. Has the situation got worse? Or is theory of history still in such a strong position in the Netherlands? I think there was a certain danger of philosophy of history courses disappearing in favor of the kind of courses that faculty administrators very much like. Very broad introductions to philosophy of science uh, given to hundreds of undergraduates from all sorts of humanities programs. Um, to some extent that's happening indeed and at Leiden we have such courses too. Uh, I, I do notice at some universities where philosophy of history courses have indeed been replaced by these much larger and arguably a less meaningful um, general introductions to philosophy of science. But fortunately, most departments of history, um, people have successfully objected, objected against courses that only encourage students to learn a few names of book titles and names of structuralism and post-structuralism without relating it to the actual work. Mm. So most departments have seen the need to maintain philosophy of history, uh, in, if only to provide some sort of bridge between these abstract philosophy of science classes and uh, everyday historical work in which the students are engaged. Mm. So for the moment, um, I'm mildly optimistic that mm. we have reached um, at least in the educational sense, mm. um, the, the educational programs, a fairly stable position mm. for uh, historiography and philosophy history. Mm. Yes, what really fascinates and inspires me is that if this kind of trajectory was possible in the Netherlands, which ended in a relatively strong position for theory and philosophy of history, so maybe it could be replicated somewhere else. Although I hear you, you describe it dependent on very specific uh, circumstances, yeah. uh, societal, historical context, environment that had a big factor to play that it went in this way. Uh, but maybe, maybe it's still possible, or maybe do you think it's it's we are we are sort of dependent on the external forces, if I can describe in this way. Well, external factors are only one factor among others. Mm. I mean, you also need talented people, mm. uh, and the uh, sort of success story of Dutch philosophy of history would not have been possible without mm. gifted scholars able to make the best out of these opportunities. Yeah. Um, I do think that. Um, academics are no exception to, uh, to fashions and waves that come and go. Um, if I think of the field of history of the humanities, um, which I like very much, uh, I see there is a lot of energy and positive commitment, especially young scholars, to something called the history of the humanities. Um, What's happening there is not always very different from what happened in what we used to call historiography or philosophy of history. Also philosophical reflection on uh, scholarly practices or on the humanities at large mm. can be encountered at History of Humanities conferences and in the Journal of History of Humanities. But such a newer name, maybe it's slightly more attractive to some than philosophy of history, which may have acquired old-fashioned connotations or so. Mm. Um, so I do think that 
because of developments within academia, but also about broader societal developments, which make us, I think, it gives us ample reason for reflection on our relations mm. to the past. Yes. These types of questions will um, not go away. Yes. But whether they will be branded as philosophy mm. history, that's not a matter. Yes. Remember that back in the late 19th century, sociology and philosophy of history were almost interchangeable terms, at least to many users of the terms. Mm. Mm. Um, so philosophy of history also happens in areas not designated as such. Mm. Maybe that's... So this takes us back to the beginning, I think. Um, talking about what philosophy of history maybe in the form of HBH can offer for the wider world, or yeah. maybe helps us to understand the world around us. Uh, populism maybe, or maybe other kind of turbulences that we see, see around us. You already talked about post-concepts. You had a project or conference on the post-concepts, and one of the post-concepts is post-truth, for example. Yeah. Well, and that's prominently in my yeah, project. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> that might be something where perhaps philosophy of history could help to understand is, is there such an era of phenomenon as post truth and what is it and what, what we should do about it? Yeah. How should we react to it? But also, if you think of the politics of nostalgia that you see everywhere across Europe, in the US, uh, and elsewhere, um, that is something which we have something to say, I think. And, um, I think that consistent with the preferred um, research modes of our time, projects, short-term projects devoted to exploring such currently relevant issues could well bring together mm. um, philosophers, historians, but also others um, to help us understand um, these things. And um, it can show the relevance of philosophy of history, even if philosophy of history would always be one voice among others. Mm. It will not be a strategy for uh, reclaiming or claiming new ground for philosophy of history so as to mm. bolster its disciplinary identity. It will be a way of, I think, um, seeking connections to people elsewhere. That's how I like to think of philosophy of history um, as I said earlier, its own disciplinary identity is very, very weak mm. and there is not very much we can do about it. Mm. But that's an advantage if you see a philosophy of history as a conversation partner mm. to not only historians, but to a broader range of um, scholars in the humanities and social sciences. Mm. And such themes as the one you mentioned, mm. both truth mm. and the sort of implicit regimes of historicity or philosophies of history implied in such a term. Mm. In what sense are we post-truth mm. and what kind of truth are we talking about? Mm. Um, philosophers of history could have wonderful uh, things to contribute to interdisciplinary conversations around such topical issues. Mm. Yeah, it's also a question that springs to my mind is then when was the time of truth then? Yeah. Well, what is the area of truth if you are now in the post era? Exactly, that's, that's what it's question. Uh, so historians will be involved as well. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Should we have more outreach to write to newspapers or to speak to the wider world? I think we uh, maybe first have to address such uh, themes uh, as scholars in our own gatherings, in our own um, journals. I think many of us. Uh, already find ourselves um, addressing larger audience, writing in newspapers and things like that as a sort of side activity. Um, nothing if compared to our real scholarly work. Mm. But the challenge would be to devote some real scholarly energy to these um, urgent questions. Yes. Um, so once again, I think that um, the, I mean, someone's book on history and financial times is just a excellent example yeah. of something that we could do um, perhaps more often in n not only in single author text but maybe in collaborative projects using our historical and philosophical uh, resources for 
exploring such topical themes. Yes. That would really is something uh, I would be happy to join that kind of initiative. Yes. So, um, Herman, what are your future plans? What kind of research projects or other kind of projects or topics are you envisioning and thinking about? Well, um, I just started two new things, a chair in the history of the humanities, as well as a five-year research project on scholarly vices, a long durée history, um, which, is, uh, which will keep me pretty busy for uh, the next few years. Um, no concrete plans for after this five-year period, but what I think um, the um, scholarly vices project um, might yield is not only a series of historical publications, but also some big questions that really ask for cooperation with uh, philosophers. It's a historical project in which I'm engaged. I have a whole team of historians now working on various um, discourses and practices related to scholarly vices. But I do look forward to um, to um, exchanging ideas with virtue epistemologists. There is even a small branch of philosophers who call themselves vice epistemologists these days. Um, for I think that especially the sort of long-term history, which I'm now trying to explore, will raise some very fundamental questions about what vices are, what scholarship is. Uh, so, as usual, these kind of projects tend to raise more questions than they answer. And um, I think this theme will, um, will occupy me for quite a while and maybe also turn out to be a theme quite, which lends itself quite well to these kind of HPS conversations that we have been talking about. Yes, thank you. Herman, many thanks for this interview. It has been really an interesting dialogue. It's our it's pleasure. It's my pleasure. Thank you very much. Thank you.